This year has been an interesting year for me in terms of sermon preparation. Every now and then, every few weeks sometimes, uh, uh, having pastored and having preached for 46 years and having pastored a lot of that, uh, something will come to your mind that you preach some, somewhere else and, and you want to pull that, at, you know, kind of trot that out, dust it off and see if it'll still hunt. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's never the same. You revise it for those people at that time. Uh, but as we've been going through this process of reading the Bible through together, and some of you know that I'm working on a devotional book called a Through the Bible in a Year devotional book, and I've been, I've been posting the first drafts of each day's devotion on our TOLM Friends page. It's called Pastor Dan's Takeaways. Um, and I, in that devotion, I write about some common theme between the two random readings, Old and New Testament. Well, in the process this year, I can only think of one time that the Lord has, you know, kind of quickened me to dust off an older sermon. I preached this summer a sermon called uh, A Superfluity of Righteousness. Uh, I had preached that once before. And to be honest, I have preached it again since I preached it to you somewhere else. Uh, but every other Sunday this year, and so we're hitting on, uh, what, 48 Sundays, maybe 49, uh, that's the only Sunday that you did not get a brand new, uh, right out of the gate, fresh out of the oven sermon that came out of reading the Bible through together. And... Uh, uh, so this week, now sometimes it might take three or four weeks for that sermon to materialize uh, in my mind uh, before I would preach it. But this week, uh, I have uh, a message for you uh, based on uh, a single verse in something we read earlier in the week. And it's from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. And I've entitled it, the four pillars of wise living. Now, I have to confess that teaching and, and preparing and teaching all week, uh, uh, week after week on Proverbs and talking about be, be wise, don't be foolish, how to live wisely, maybe that is coloring how I'm looking at other things. But when I read this one verse in the voice, it just stood out to me. I thought, hey, there are four things. If we would just do this, we would have happier homes, happier, healthier churches, more civil communities, uh, even on the national level. How many of you know that there's fussing and arguing and name calling all over the place? All right? And now it has gotten into our national discourse. The Democrats call the Republicans names, and the Republicans call the Democrats names, and the Republicans that are mad at other Republicans call the other Republicans names, and, and the uh, uh, people from different churches call each other names, right? Uh, now, this is not totally new. When I was growing up, uh, we were called holy rollers uh, at school. Uh, anybody else have that wonderful privilege, right? Where's Winford? I know Winford was a holy roller, all right? Remember that? You know, and uh, I got so confused. I told them at, at school, I said, our church doesn't have a bowling team. I didn't know what they were talking about. And I, <laughs> and I went home, and my dad explained it to me. They said, they were making fun of you. I said, for shouting? I said, goodness, they don't know what they're missing. They need to come to our church on Sunday night. <laughs> um, so name-calling and, and disrespect is not something new, but it seems to be everywhere today. Right? People are shooting and stabbing each other over a place in line to buy a chicken sandwich. Can you believe that? And, I mean, that case stood out in my mind because that's the same... That Popeye's is at the corner where you turn to go into Anna Kay's school where she teaches. Uh, I've passed it many times. Fortunately, she doesn't like Popeye's chicken. 
<laughs> uh, but she goes to the McDonald's next door four or five times a week to get her coffee or get her, a sand or her biscuit for breakfast. All right. And so that's what's on my mind. Now I want to read, I'm going to preach out of the voice, but I want to read you this verse out of the NIV in the beginning. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. That's what I sense is going on here today. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Four discreet thoughts. Now our text is from verse 17, but I want to give us the context for the text by starting back at verse 1. Now we've already sung some of it, and a lot of it is very familiar. And this is not just a new sermon for me to preach. Um, this is a, a verse that I, I honestly can say that in 65 years of going to church, uh, I cannot remember ever hearing it preached on, right? this particular verse. Now, I can't account for the first six or seven years, but uh, the rest of them, I have a pretty good memory of what I've heard. I want to start by talking about our calling as a community of Christ followers, as a church, as Christians. And look at what uh, Peter says. So get rid of hatefulness, deception, of insincerity and jealousy and slander. All right? Do you hear that? Those are five things that if we would get rid of these, we would be in much better shape as a community, both in our homes, in our churches, and in our interaction with the people outside the church, our neighbors, in business. So let's repeat those again. Hatefulness. You've heard me say uh, a quote from Lee Grady. I heard him say this in 2011. I still remember the date, January the 1st. And uh, uh, he was the editor of Charisma magazine at the time. And he said, the only thing worse than a mean person is a mean person who speaks in tongue. Or a mean person who speaks in religious language. A mean person who quotes scripture. All right? um, and so we need to get rid of hatefulness and even a hateful response when somebody's made you mad or ticked you off the wrong, or pushed you, or rubbed your fur. We'll use a cat metaphor for Susanna the wrong way. <laughs> All right. And, and the rest of you cat lovers here. Um, the second one is deception. Uh, the, one of the first things my father taught me, and he taught me so early, I thought it was in the Bible at first, was Shakespeare. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Right? <laughs> and he would say that because he knew I had said something that was intended to hide the full truth. It wasn't a lie. I just didn't tell the whole truth. And I intended for him to think something other than what I said, what was the truth. Insincerity. Those are people who do stuff, but it's not from their heart. It's not from their heart. Uh, I'm not going to spend this much time on every verse. Don't get scared. I'm going to spend a lot of time on the first verse and on the last verse. All right? But uh, because the first one says, don't do these things, right? The last verse says, instead, do these things. But that word sincere or insincere is important. The word sincere that was taken from Greek into Latin means uh, without wax. Without wax. All right? Now, at the time, uh, artwork, much of it was carved statuary. And uh, I don't know if you've ever carved a statue before. <laughs> But it would seem to be a lot of chiseling and a lot of time. Well, what if you almost finish a statue uh, and uh, let's say you were trying to make money so you have chiseled a giant statue of Elvis. You know somebody in Danville is going to buy that, right? And give you enough money to, sell Christmas, to buy Christmas presents. And you get right toward the end and a little bit of the wrong... Thing and you knock off Elvis's earlobe. Well, what are you going to do? Start over? There's no super glue. 
So you know what they used to do? They would take a very hard kind of wax and they would mix in uh, dirt and other things that would make it look just like the stone and they would get that earlobe on there and then they would sell it to you. All right? Uh, if, you, if you bought a statue, you wanted to buy it sincere. That means it had a certification that it has been stood out in the middle of the public square for a full day in the hot sun to guarantee that there's no wax. Because if you put it out there in the hot sun, the wax melts away. There are a lot of Christians who have put on their Christian wax to go to church, right? And they get into a little bit of a scuffle or a little bit, they get jostled a little bit and uh, or they go home, they go to work, and, and all of a sudden that stuff just melts off, and you can see they don't have a heart. <laughs> all right? They don't have love. They don't have what they seem to be. So what he's telling us is that what you do needs to come from your heart. From your heart. What's the next one? And jealousy. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Pastors learn very quickly that... You better not brag. If you brag on one person doing something, which you know I do all the time, uh, I like to encourage people and brag on them uh, and thank them. Uh, if you do that, somebody else is going to stub up. Right? If you bring a, a little gift that you think, if I found some earrings, if I knew uh, that, that Liz liked, I don't know, porcupines, for some reason she collected them. I don't mean real ones, but... All right. And I found some porcupine earrings, and I went, hey, I think Liz would like this. And I would bring them to church and say, Liz, I thought you would like this. Never gave me any earrings. Right? That's just the fellas. No. <laughs> and they said, so you've got to be really careful, really careful. If you want to single someone out for retiring from a ministry and we, we had a person who retired from doing a ministry for 30, 36 uh, years. And she said, whatever you do, do not call me up and give me that award because it'll make so-and-so mad. I thought, Lord, is this a church or is this some kind of recovery group? I don't know. What, what is this? I'm talking, you know, if we didn't have any jealousy, we would be happy for somebody else to get a gift. We'd be happy for somebody else's child to be singled out or to sing a solo or hop on the drums. Uh, we would sit over here, you never asked me to play the drums. That's because you got no rhythm whatsoever. No, you never expressed any interest in playing the drums. We So, I just thought I'd make a few, po oh, slander, slander. Well, you know why a pastor did that. He didn't like me. Slander is telling stuff that's just not true. That, de or in, that defames somebody else's in, in, in people's eyes. So wouldn't we be better off as a family if families didn't do any of this stuff? If they didn't, they probably wouldn't be avoiding going to a family gathering at Christmas. <laughs> Sometimes it's so bad in families, you go, I guess I've got to go to uncle's funeral, but I really don't. Right? Have you ever been to a funeral where you got there a little late and then you took off? Am I the only one? Okay. <laughs> I was preaching. Um, no. <laughs> am, I, am I not? Is this not resonating with you? Right? Have you, have you ever had this? We're, we're all meeting over at so-and-so's house. Well, is, is cousin so-and-so going to be there? You've got to find out who's going to be there before you decide if you can go. Or, or you decide how thick a skin you need to put on before you go. And by the way, if the Lord tells you to go, he can go with you and he can show you what to say. He can keep you from getting your feelings hurt. I mean, he can do all that, right? But don't dread it all December. Don't sit around all December. It's just much easier to just say, uh, I'm not going. Okay. Butch and I have decided we're just going to celebrate at home alone this year. How's that? <laughs> oh, Sorry, Mary, I forgot you had family here. Uh, <laughs> you know I'm just using this as an example. All right. Uh, now, be like newborn babies 
crying out for spiritual milk that will help you grow into salvation. You know, you got saved, but you got to grow into it. You got to learn how to inhabit your salvation. You got to learn how to walk it out. If you have tasted and found the Lord to be good, come to him, the living stone, who was rejected by people, but accepted by God as chosen and precious. As long as you're accepted by God, who cares if you're rejected by some of your family members or coworkers or neighbors? Like living spiritual sacrifices that will be acceptable to God through Jesus uh, oh, I missed the line. Like, li like living stones, let... You see why I'm going to the eye doctor. Uh, like living stones, let yourselves be assembled into a spiritual house. I could preach all day on any of these verses. I'm not going to. I'm going to show self-control and just read it. A holy order of priests who offer up spiritual sacrifice to be acceptable to God through Jesus the anointed. For it says in the words of Isaiah, see here I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, a chosen and precious, whoever depends upon him will never be disgraced. To you who believe and depend on him, he is precious. But to you who don't, remember the words of the psalmist, the stone that the builders rejected has become laid as the cornerstone the very stone that holds together the entire foundation. And of Isaiah, or remember Isaiah, a stone that blocks their way, a rock that trips them, a stone of stumbling, scandalon. They stumble because they don't follow the word of God. Well, there's a whole sermon right there, isn't it? As they were destined to. You hear people talk about destiny. I'm a person of destiny. Right? What does that mean? All right? Well, in almost every case, when the Bible talks about destiny, it talks about us being born as sinners who are destined to go to hell. All right? And what, what saves us from that destiny is embracing Jesus. But here we have the example that we are, as Christians, we are destined to follow the Word of God. Most people use that concept today as, I am destined to be a big somebody. I'm going to be a humdinger. I'm going to be something special. Right? Um, no. You are destined to humble yourself at the foot of the cross and become a disciple of Jesus Christ and let the Word of God tell you how to live and make changes accordingly. That's our destiny. We're a chosen people set aside to be a royal order of priests, a holy nation, God's own, so that you may proclaim the wondrous acts of the one who called you out of inky darkness into shimmering light. Oh, I love that translation. What are we, why are we following the word of God? Why are we formed into a people? Why are we called? To be a witness to the gospel, to tell people that Jesus has come and Jesus can save and Jesus is coming again. Once you were not a people. That verse is really, since, since we sang it, it's been in my heart and I looked at how we're coming together. Uh, we're now God's people. Once you didn't have mercy, once you were going to hell. And des deservedly so. But now you've received it. So how are we to live? Beloved, remember, you don't belong to this world. <laughs> I love this line. You are resident aliens living in exile. Resident aliens. A lot of folks assume, especially if they don't like other people, or they don't like changes, that all these Hispanic people, they're just from who knows where they're from. Well, uh, I read an interesting statistic this morning. 65% of Hispanic people in America are from America. <laughs> they were born here. Born here. 35% uh, were born in other places, like my son-in-law. Right? And, and so I, I don't know how they feel. I try to pay attention. Uh, Gwen's brother-in-law, born in Lebanon, um, my son-in-law, born in, in Honduras, I like to see how they adjust and how they're treated by people, you know. Um, uh, but you don't seem to understand that as a Christian, you're the resident alien. <laughs> you're the foreigner. 
you're the immigrant. You're the one whose this world is not my home. Don't you remember it? I'm only passing through. Right? Uh, and I'm thankful. Thankful for America. Thankful for our freedoms. Thankful. Thankful for this beautiful place where we live. I think this area, Virginia and North Carolina, is prettier than any place I've ever been. I keep, no matter how far I roam, I keep getting drawn back here. You know, it's like the Roanoke and Dan Rivers have some kind of a magnetic hold on me, and I just can't get very far away from them. Now, the reason I'm bringing that out is that you've got to remember you're just here temporarily. So resist those desires of the flesh that battle against your soul. Live honorably among the outsiders. Live honorably among those who this is their home. They're not aliens. This world and its world system, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they are part of it. They're still destined for hell. They haven't met Jesus Christ yet. When you're with them, live honorably among them. They're not your enemy. They're the object of your ministry and your outreach. So that when, when some may be inclined to call you criminals, uh, when they see your good works, they may give glory to God when he returns in judgment. For the Lord's sake, accept the decrees and laws of all the various human institutions, whether they come from the highest human ruler or agents he sends out to punish those who do wrong and reward those who do well. We are to be subject to our governmental authorities as unto the Lord when they have been put in place, even if they're not believers, to punish the wicked and to reward good. Now, if you live under a government that punishes the good and persecutes and that sort of thing, you're not under an obligation. You're to pray for them, but you're not under an obligation to follow what they tell you to do. If the government decides to... Uh, uh, let's say, put all people who claim to be born again in a nut house. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. In a facility for nuts. And, uh, right, they want to put you there. They're going to do that. Uh, and and, and uh, nobody knows, and you're kind of getting along, and, and they come to me and they say, that, that Bart's fellow, isn't he one of those born-again Christians? Oh, yeah, I've heard him say it many times. Right. Yeah, I'm not going to throw Jimmy under the bus, right? I don't know if I'm going to lie, but I'm not going to turn him over to them. Does that make sense to you? All right. For the Lord's sake, we're to follow our rulers. Verse 15, you see, it is God's will that by doing what is right and good, you should hush the gabbing ignorance of the foolish. Live as those who are free and not as those who use their freedom as a pretext for evil, but live as God's servants. There are always people who want to say, well, I have grace, and once I'm saved, I'm always saved, and so I can enjoy just about anything that's out there. You know? Um, I've heard it, and you've heard it. Right? But what does this verse say? Don't use your freedom in Christ as a pretext to sin when the Bible clearly tells us how to live. Do no harm to your body. Avoid drunkenness. All of those sorts of things. I, I have encountered people in ministry who think because they have been saved and they have their ticket punched that they can have extramarital affairs. You say, well, maybe it's not the best thing, but at least I'm going to heaven. We can't do that, folks. And so here is the background that leads us up to the four pillars. And I've sort of, they'll sort of preach themselves. They are much easier to see in the voice than in the first verse that I read. Because they're in four discrete sentences. Little short sentences. Number one... Respect everyone. Do you see the verb? Respect everyone. Number two, love the community of believers. Number three, reverence, and that word is best translated fear, God. And if you come to our Proverbs class, you know from 
verse 8, 13, that to fear God means that you hate sin. That's all it means. That's all it means. You hate what he hates, you love what he loves, then you fear God, you reverence God. And then the last one is, honor your ruler. The first one said emperor. We don't have an emperor, right? <laughs> We're not France in the early 19th century. We're or Russia in the early 20th century. We don't have an emperor, although usually uh, people from other parties accuse whoever's in power of thinking they're an emperor, right? The Republicans talked about, I heard them talk about uh, Emperor Obama, and now we hear about Emperor Trump. Well, we don't have an emperor. We have a president. Right? So we have a leader, and we have Congress, we have governor, uh, and we, have, we have a legislature, we have a, uh, you know, Danville, Pennsylvania County, they have their leaders uh, who are elected uh, to lead us. And so as we go through this, I would like for you to think about, and I'm almost through, the purpose of this sermon is to lead you up to a point where you'll go home and think about it. Right? Think about it. The old term I used when I was growing up is go home and cogitate on it. Get your cogitator. You know, after your mashed potatoes, you get your cogitator. And you, you put it in your machine and start working it, okay? Study on it. I love that. Study to show thyself approved and a workman who needeth not to, to be ashamed. I'm giving you a high five, but. There we go. <laughs> I love that. No, the first one is respect everyone. Dysfunctional families don't operate because people don't respect each other. All right? Uh, workplaces. Have you ever been in a job where you were disrespected? Where you weren't respected? People are happy at work when they are respected. Right? If you want to see somebody work harder at work, then let them know they are appreciated. People who are appreciated, right, give them a bonus, give them a, a raise, give them, help them with their insurance, give them a compliment. Right? Make them, let them park in the employee of the month parking spot one month. I mean, people like to be appreciated. And we need to respect each other. Respect each other's opinion. And if you want to see a disaster in that area, look at Facebook. And when someone makes a comment about the country or about the culture or about politics or something like that, uh, even if it's not an ugly comment, it's just trying to express an idea, get people to think, right? You need to put your bike helmet on because you're going to get pounded, right? Pounded, right? And called names and told you're stupid and all sorts of other things. What in the world is wrong with people? I guess it has to be the same thing that's always been wrong with people. Sin, but Christians respect God's creation. We respect other people. We may not like what they're doing. We may not agree with them, but we don't sass them. We don't try to tear them down. We don't build them, tear them down so we have something we can climb up on and make ourselves feel better. So I want you to go home. I've left, I didn't put anything by these. I left some room so maybe today or this afternoon or Tomorrow, you could jot some ideas in for yourself. Number two, love the community of believers. That word community is from the same word that's quanania that we looked at at the end of uh, 2 Corinthians in that last verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 14, the, the love of God, the grace of his son, and the communion or Fellowship, ongoing fellowship, koinonia of the Holy Ghost. Uh, what is it that makes us, what do we have in common? It's the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ in us because we were saved, placed in us by the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's what we have in common. And if I don't love you, then, then I'm not loving God. 
Does it mean I have to agree with you? Does it mean I have to like everything that you say or do? No. But we must love each other. And we must love this communion. That's what overwhelmed me in the middle of the service was a sense of peace. And all of us who don't even know each other that well, and we just have a sense of communion here together. A community here together. And it's not because we all have similar personalities or anything like that. What is it about us? It's Jesus dwelling in us by the Holy Ghost. That's what we have in common. That's what we have in common. And if you don't love that, then something's wrong with your... I started to say lover, but that's not the right word. <laughs> that thing you love with. Something's wrong with your heart. <laughs> Got out of that one. At least they're not, oh, they are taping. Uh, I get myself in trouble. I just wasn't too aware of it until I came here where they record everything. And then I'm really aware of it. Uh, and the next one is reverence God, fear God. Right? Do you care what he thinks about your life? Does it matter to you? He has called us, we have seen, to fulfill our destiny. On our way to the witness, to the gospel, we are to discipline ourselves by his word. We are to follow his word. All right? And if you want to know what, Jesus, what the Lord God thinks of this when people don't follow his word, read the Old Testament. That's what it is. The Lord would say, they took my word and threw it behind, my, behind their back. Right? And so I'm going to have to shake their world up because I love them to get their attention and, and get them to the point of repenting so they'll go get my word and put it in front of their eyes. And number four, honor your ruler. I'll make this real simple. I don't want to be political. Uh, I made a statement last week I hope wasn't misinterpreted uh, uh, because I just, I get upset when our leaders cuss on public. I mean, I just... I don't care what, you know, I don't care what party they're in, even if I like what they're doing, right? Uh, if um, uh, I had a doctor in, in uh, old Navy, I mean, Army surgeon trying to get out a terrible tooth that he was trying to extract a couple years ago, and he was cussing up a storm, and he had my mouth open, and I was in horrible pain, and he was, and he was my only hope, right? <laughs> And he was just cussing right and left. And I couldn't talk, but I went, uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, that's the best I could do. Like, please. <laughs> I'm in enough pain. I don't need to hear my, my, my rescuer cussing. Um, and, uh, and so I want us to, to I, I want you to make sure you hear this in a non-political sort of way. Um, I refuse to call a president by their last name. I'm sick of it. I was raised, you refer to Mr. Mr. Eisenhower or President Eisenhower, right? Some of you don't think I'm that old. President Kennedy or Mr. That's the official title of a president is Mr., right? Mr. Johnson, oh, I could get in trouble here if I forget somebody. Right on through Mr. Bush and Mr. Obama and Mr. Trump or President Trump. And no matter how mad I've been at some of these presidents and their policies, I am not about to call them Trump or Obama or any ugly names. Even if the presidents are calling other people ugly names, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I was raised better than that. I was raised in a Christian home. You show people respect. When I pray for President Trump, I call him President Trump. When I'm happy with him, I call him President Trump. When he's done a little cussing, made me mad, I call him President Trump, right? Uh, when President Obama was, uh, spent one term saying that he was going to oppose homosexual marriage, I called him Mr. Obama, right? When he flip-flopped and changed his mind as soon as he got in his second term, I still called him Mr. Obama. It's a matter of respect, respect. Right through Governor Northam. I call him Governor Northam 
whether he's in white face or black face or whether he's, he's doing something great on the news or embarrassing the daylights out of all of us native-born Virginians. All right? And I pray for him. He's not even my governor. All right? I got issues with my governor, but I still call him Governor Cooper. Right? I don't call him Roy. <laughs> I, I don't know him. If I knew him and he told me I could call him Roy, my mentor, Dr. Vincent Sinan, turns 85 today. He has tried for the last 30 years to get me to call him Vincent. I cannot do it. We wrote a book together. We spent countless hours together. And uh, Dr. Sinan, can I get you a cup of coffee? <laughs> I just can't. I can't do it. I'm trying to show respect to elders, right? I'm trying to show respect to my elders, to show respect to people in authority. You know, and when you want to criticize someone in authority, you need to think twice. Because if you were carrying what they're carrying, the weight they're carrying, you might crumble like a cookie. Right? So just be careful. Be careful. Is everybody if we want to have a polite society, then we've got to be polite. If we want to have a friendly society, we have to show ourselves friendly. If we want to have a respectful society, we have to show respect. Respect. There was a case uh, the night before Thanksgiving... Of, uh, and I'm not going to mention political parties, but where one national leader uh, went into a, uh, a, a kind of a Thanksgiving gathering at a, a place in uh, Georgetown uh, that is kind of a hangout for Georgetown graduates. And another political leader who also graduated from Georgetown was there. And over an, a political issue... As the man came in, he stood up in front of hundreds of people and cussed him out and screamed at him and challenged him to a fight and said, hit me, hit me, hit me. A national political leader, the other leader, and I would, I would tell you I was proud of him whether he was my party or the other party. I'm, the other leader just said, excuse me, and walked around him and went to his table. Right? Now, how many of you know that some of us wouldn't have done that, right? We'd have felt sorry for ourselves and run out crying, or, or we would have jacked his jaw. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, but the Christian, if you want a respectful society, and what does this just say? When you're ridiculed, when you're thrown in jail, if you want, if you want a respectful society, especially when there's disrespect, you treat people with Respect. Don't let them, and I can almost hear my mother's words echoing in my, in my ear. Don't let them pull you down to their level. So four pillars of wise living. Respect who? Everyone. Everyone. I don't care if they've got green hair, no hair. Uh, uh, matted hair, I don't care. Show respect to everyone. Love the church. Love the believers. Right. You, it didn't say, some of us say, I'll respect people at church, but I'm not respecting those people out there. If you've got neighbors who are a little loud, get a little drunk, you hear some cussing over there, by disrespecting them, you never win them to the Lord. Right? You, by going over and saying, I just can't believe you live this way. I work too hard for my money. I put up with this nonsense next door. Right? You know it's true. Right? We don't do that, do we? Show them respect. Love all of the church people. Reverence God. Fear God. Respect his word and be concerned about how he feels about how you live his word <coughs> and honor your rulers. It wouldn't hurt you to pray with your leaders. Pray for your leaders weekly, monthly, even daily. Call them by name. Pray for the president. I, eight years of President Obama... I called his name in prayer. Never once did I call him Obama. <laughs> uh, uh, I called him President Obama. 
I called his name in prayer at the beginning of every single day for eight years. And I didn't say, Lord, change him, get him, sick him, get him out of office. Right? right? I said, Lord, help him to lead us the right way. If you think, well, I don't, I don't like our president. It could, you could have not liked the last one or not liked this one. It doesn't matter. We live in a democracy, and uh, um, I, I clearly, we clearly we get who we pick, right? And we probably get who we deserve. <laughs> and so we need to remember that. Honor, and then go on and pray for your representatives. Some of you don't even know who your representative and your two senators are in Washington, Right? All right, and you need to pray for them, and um, and pray for your representatives in Richmond, pray for your sheriff, pray for your police chief, pray for your mayor, pray for the chairman of your board, pray for your council. Uh, I am so thankful that there are people in Martinsville who are praying for our son Jim since he's been on city council, and they're praying for him. He knows that because people tell him that they call his name in prayer. Pray for the Supreme Court. <coughs> Pray for the leaders. Pray for the military <coughs> who, are, who are in harm's way to protect our freedoms. All right. I know this is a little different kind of sermon. Uh, I have an ending and then a prayer, but I want to uh, encourage you that the real ending of the sermon is when you sit down and make a few notes by some of these or all of these. Because remember what I've challenged us is, let's think about each of these in our 21st century context. How does this apply to me in Gretna, or me in Eden, or me in Danville? Uh, how does this apply to me uh, wherever I am? How does this apply to me at my family Christmas dinner? How does it apply to me when I go to work? How does it apply to me at school? How does it apply to me when I go to Planet Fitness or when I go to the PTA meeting or the school concert? How does it apply to me? Respect everyone. Love the community of believers. Reverence God. Fear God. Honor the rulers. And my last thought to you, though, is that it's not enough to behave right. Do you remember that word at the beginning, insincerity? Yesterday morning, the missionary that our church supports, Kevin Sneed, sent, uh, I found something that he had written, I had written down that he had written years, several years ago. And I brought it out. He said this, Christ is not looking for a people merely trained to behave well. We're not the Lord's performing monkeys. Right? All right, there are a lot of religions who will teach you how to act. Right? But he says, he is after a people whose behavior flows naturally from a mind like his own. Even people who can behave well, even people who can behave well can think badly. We are all called to live, I write, from a transformed heart. I'm not trying to inculcate in you a certain type of behavior. All right? I was raised never to disrespect the president by calling him by his last name. All right? If I'd never met the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a good chance that I still would not call the president by just his last name because I had good parents who drilled that in me. <laughs> right? I still, I, I still let the phone ring six times. Not five, not seven. Because my mama told me that you let the phone ring six times uh, and then let it hang up. Don't bother them. Well, we have people who call us and let it ring for an hour and a half. <laughs> so why, why and, and I've met people who let it ring three times and go, oh, they're not there. <laughs> and, right, and the poor old person just now getting out of the recliner, you know. <laughs> and so, but what I'm saying is, I want you to do these four things because Jesus Christ has been formed in your heart by the Holy Spirit and you want to do it from the love of God that is in you. 
So I'm not trying to turn us in to a group of well-behaved, good citizens. When our son Jim taught uh, uh, civics at Drury Mason Middle School, I think it was, years ago, uh, his theme for that class is, we're going to learn to be good citizens, seventh graders. We're going to learn how to treat the flag, how to honor the president. We're going to learn how to, how, how to act. Uh, have you ever, like, there's people who you're waiting, you try to get off the elevator and they run over you to get in it? Like, I think, were you raised in a stall somewhere? I mean, what? <laughs> my mother told me, if I tried to hop on an elevator while some old people hadn't gotten off yet, this would have been my shirt right here, and I would have been, whoom, <laughs> right over there, right? Or my dad, too. Right? Just basic stuff. But I'm telling you, if we're going to have a good society, we have to do it from the heart. You know what the difference is? You're, if you're trained to do it, you'll do it when things are going well. But if it's coming from your heart, you'll do it when things are going bad. Right? Have you ever met people who are so controlled, self-controlled, and so dignified, and so prim, and so proper, and then somebody pushes them over the edge, and they just go wild? Right? Why? Because that was just a veneer of training. It didn't come from the heart. If it's in your heart, no matter how many times somebody knocks you down, or cusses you, or disrespects you, What's in your heart's what's in your heart. And that's what's going to come out. Amen?